We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Happy to see you all here this morning. Happy New Year to those I haven't said that to yet. Really excited. Uh, just so you know, uh, while we do have an incredible 10 o'clock service, you all know that. Look how awesome you look. We have a wonderful 815 service also. <laughs> Uh, so if any of you are up for a change this year, uh, we have some extra seats at that 815 service. Really glad that you all are here. My name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor. And uh, yeah, I'd love to meet you between service. I usually hang out in the lobby somewhere. Hey, so we're starting a brand new series today called Run to Win. And I got a question for you. How many of you are like highly competitive? Whatever you do, you have to win at it. Right? How many, any other highly competitive people in here? Uh, are, some of you, you probably know because your family has banned certain games from the house. We're not allowed to play Monopoly in my house. Like it's, my wife is also highly competitive. And so what I've learned is if we're ever playing a team game with other, like another couple, I make sure that my wife and I are on the same team. So that at the end of the day, we either win victoriously together or we're upset together. Because if one of us is a winner and one of us is a loser, that's a really, really rough night. I'm just saying, right? So, but here's the thing. Like, in, in life, we, we have this concept of, of winning. And for some reason, the world right now teaches that, you know, hey, it, it feels like something that, that's never really been done before, where we're, stop, we're not keeping score anymore in games sometimes, and we're, we just tell everybody you're a winner no matter what, right? And everybody gets a participation trophy at the end of the day. And I just want you to know, that's, that's nonsense, all right? Like, the Bible says that we need to run a race in order to win it. God doesn't want you to get a participation trophy in this life. Uh, living for him. He's like, oh, well, you, you participated. Here you go, right? He wants us to run a race in such a way as to win the race. Let me show you where that comes from in scripture. Two, two key verses. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So help me out here. Run to win. There it is right there. Run to to win. Everybody is going to race. Everybody who is racing is going to run. And everybody who's running, uh, well, they should be running in such a way as to win. Otherwise, like, what are you running for? Don't enter the race to come into second place. Don't be like, all right, I'm going to enter this bad boy. I really hope to come in fifth today. Like, no, you enter the race in such a way as to run it so that you can win it. Now, you might not win a foot race. Someone else might come ahead of you, but we're going to run like we want to win right? There's another verse that comes to mind. It kind of answers the question of what that prize is. What, what is the prize that we're running for? Paul says in his letter to people in Philippi, he says, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So here's Paul again Paul said this in the letter to the Corinthian people just a moment ago, and now he's saying it to the church in Philippi, hey, I'm going to run my race, and I'm going to run it to receive this heavenly prize. Now, the question is, what is this prize? At some point, if you're a follower of Christ in this room, you're going to, your, your life here in the natural world is going to end, and your, your life in the supernatural experience with God will begin. You'll be in the presence of God, and at that point, you will receive the prize for which you lived and ran this whole life here. And, and ultimately, you want to know what that prize is? It's, it's a relationship, an eternal relationship with God the Father. But even to add to that, right, not only is it a relationship with God the Father, but it's complete restoration in all areas of your health. 
In that moment, you're completely restored back to full righteousness. You're, you're restored uh, in, in your health. You're restored in all. God basically gives you a, not only a relationship with him, but he restores you out of this broken world and into the world that is perfect, that he's created for you. All things are put back the way they're supposed to be. And so what Paul says he's running towards, that he's pressing on, each of us has the ability to live this life in such a way as to grow into that level of health, that level of maturity. One day we're going to claim that prize, but every day hopefully we're getting closer and closer to that. We want to run this race in such a way as to win. So ultimately, the series that we're starting today, and it'll go five weeks, is a series about health. How can we make sure that we're spiritually healthy as we run this race? How can we make sure we're physically healthy as we run this race and uh, financially healthy? And how can we make sure our relationships are healthy as we run this race? How can we make sure we're mentally and emotionally healthy as we run this race? So we're going to take five weeks and we're going to talk about health in those five categories and what it looks like to run to win. I, I don't think I'm alone in this, but I really dislike going to the doctor's office. Anyone else with me? I don't enjoy it. Probably the worst. I don't mind going when I'm sick because I hope the doctor will help me feel better, right? When I don't like going to the doctor is when I'm well or I think I'm well and I'm supposed to go for my annual checkup, my physical, right? And the reason why I don't like going to the physical is I feel fine. I think everything's great. And I go to the doctor and they're going to like draw my blood and have me pee in a cup and do a bunch of things. They're going to listen to my heart, listen to my lungs. And they're going to tell me a bunch of stuff that's not so great with my health that I didn't know about. And I'm going to walk away with homework. Every single year I walk away with homework. And it's not fun homework, right? It's not like, hey, you're doing great. Why don't you have a little bit more candy? It's never that. I Man, I would love that. It's always, hey, you know that stuff you really enjoy? You got to eat less of that. You know that, that walk-in stuff you don't really enjoy all that much? You need to do more of that. It's always bad homework. And so we don't really enjoy going to a physical. And I'm going to give you a heads up. The next five weeks is going to feel like you're walking into a doctor's office. God is the great physician and you're, we're all going to get a, 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 a checkup in different areas of our health. And every, every week, hopefully, you're walking away feeling like, oh, I got to work on something. And it's not going to maybe feel all that great. But I'm glad you're here because we want to talk today about really kind of the first category, uh, which is spiritual health. But let me, let me read that. Uh, if I keep reading in 1 Corinthians 9, remember what 24 says? It says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one gets the prize. So run to win. Well, guess what? This verse goes on. Here's what it says. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So run with purpose in every step. Underline that phrase for me. Run with purpose with purpose in every step. Then he says this, I am not just shadow boxing. In other words, I'm not just sitting here punching the air. Every punch and every step I take, it has a meaning and a purpose behind it. I watched this movie this past week in the theater with my wife. It was really great. I recommend it. It's family friendly. You can take your kids to watch it. It's called uh, Boys in the Boat. Has anybody seen that yet? A couple of you. I, I, I was surprised by how clean it was. It was a really great, it was a true story. It was a great movie about these, these young college guys. They're basically like the JV squad for their college. None of them have ever done crew before. And they join the University of Washington's crew team, right? And they're, they're just figuring things out. But when you're, I don't want to give away the ending, but what you ultimately realize is as they get into this boat together, they, they figure out that there's a spot where every single one of them needs to sit in this boat. There's a reason that the first person is in the first spot and not the third spot. And they realize that as they go each leg of the race, there's a speed that they need to go, and then they need to, to slow down, and then they go fast, and every leg means something. And again, I don't want to give away the ending, 
It goes well for them, all right? Without giving anything away. <laughs> Here's the point. I love this, this line where it says, right? Simply put, that I run with purpose in every step. We need to learn that every step we take, there's, there's a meaning behind it. That there's a reason that we do things a certain way. And then if you keep reading in 1 Corinthians 9, it says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. You see in that verse, that word, I discipline my body, that word discipline is actually the same word that you would use to describe uh, what you would do to a, a young, a child who's not acting right, right? When you discipline your child, it's the same thing that the Bible says we ought to do to our bodies. If we're going to run this race, by the way, some of you are like, well, I'm not an athlete. This verse is talking to athletes. No, when you become a follower of Christ, you basically sign up to run a race. I'm going to run this race. I'm now an athlete. And an athlete trains and disciplines themselves to run a certain way. And so that's what we want to do. You see, it takes intentional discipline. The type of health we're going to talk about over the next five weeks, it's not going to come naturally. You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to train yourself to do things a certain way. It's going to take work. So, we probably all know this, but when we're, uh, let's just talk about physical health for just a moment, right? If you're, someone were giving you advice on how to become physically healthier, there's usually two words that pop up, right? If you want to become more physically healthy, it's all related to diet and exercise, right? See, you already knew that. What you, diet would be what you put in your body, and there's really two sides to diet, right? There's putting good things in and not putting bad things in. So diet is kind of two-sided. And then exercise is what you kind of do with your body, right? What you put out, the output of your body. And that also has two sides. You want to do things that are good for your body to exercise it. And you also want to avoid things that are going to hurt your body. And so from a diet and exercise perspective, we end up with these four things that we're going to use all five weeks of this series. Let me put them up on the screen. Uh, these are the four things that I want you to, to think about. Number one is we want to put good stuff in. Number two, we want to keep junk out. Number three, we want to exercise. And number four, we want to be careful. Now, these will apply to physical health, financial health, relational health, mental, emotional health. And today, what we're going to talk about is spiritual health. And so as we're talking about spiritual health today... These are the four things that we're going to kind of use as our, our roadmap uh, and, and see what God's word says about those things. If everyone understands, would you give me a, I understand? Thanks. All right, let's do this together. By the way, as we're talking about spiritual health today, um, I want you to understand that with spiritual health, a spiritual health is like your foundational type of health. It's the foundation that all of us need to, to lay that foundation and then we can build other types of health on top of it. In other words, if your financial health is awesome and your physical health is strong, but your spiritual health is dead, you're not in a good place, right? Our spiritual health is that health that we're going to talk about today. We need to, we need to build that, make sure it's solid, and we can build other health on top of it. And it's also important to note that when one area of your health is bad, it's going to affect all of the other areas. If your spiritual health is off, it's going to affect your relationship with your spouse. It's going to affect your finances. It's going to affect you physically. All those things are going to be affected by it. Likewise, if your relational health is bad, it's going to affect your spiritual health. It's going to affect all the others, mental health, emotional health. So all of these are important. But spiritual health is the foundation that we're going to lay today. And let's start with the first thing. Spiritual health, number one, we want to put good stuff in. Put good stuff in. And we all understand that. That's part of dieting, right? You got to put good stuff into your body if you want to be healthy. The same is true of feeding our spirit. In Colossians 3.16, we have this incredible recipe for spiritual health. It says, let the message about Christ... In all of its richness, fill your lives. 
teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. I love the word fill. If you, if you got your Bible out or your notes out, circle that word. It says, let the message about Christ and all of its richness fill your lives. Have you ever noticed that people will, will give you uh, a dieting advice that goes something like this? If you want to try to eat less junk, fill up with good stuff, right? The more healthy, nutritious stuff you put in, the less hungry you'll be for all the junk that you want to eat, right? So you're going to fill up with good stuff and not be as hungry for the bad stuff. And the Bible says, hey, that's really true with my word. Fill up on the message of God. Fill up on this. The message of God, that would be like, fill up on the goodness of the gospel, on the truth of God's word. Spend time in this book. Fill up on it, and you will be less likely to then want to and need to consume junk into your spirit. And so we need to fill up on God's word. Let me show you a great example of of this in scripture. In, In Luke 10, we read a true story, and it says, as Jesus... And the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem. They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come help me. But the Lord said, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. What is the thing that Mary has discovered? That Jesus says, I'm not going to tell her to go get distracted by all the things and all the doing and all the, all the stuff that you're doing for me, Martha. I really appreciate it. But Mary's discovered what's truly important in this moment. And that she's sitting here at my feet, filling up on the truth that comes out of my mouth. The very most important thing you can do is sit at the feet of Jesus every morning and fill up on truth. We gotta put good stuff in. I love in Colossians 3, 16, it also has a, a verse that says, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. You know, another way that you fill up on the good stuff is you surround yourself with other believers who are also full of the good stuff. You know what's really great about our life group ministry here is you purposely do life with other people who are also filling up on the word of God. And when they overflow, when there's an overflow in their life of goodness and truth, uh, that, that's going to pour out and you're going to get hit by it. That's awesome. How great would it be to be around other people who are speaking good truth into your life that you're feeding on the wise counsel of other godly believers? I also think of like solid worship music. There's a lot of junk out there, but worship music that's solidly grounded on good doctrine, that we can just take that stuff in. The words that come from God's word, it's just good, good, nutritious food. Now, let me give you number two. Number two is to keep junk out. When you're feeding your spirit, you need to keep out the junk. Now, I think we all know this to be true, right? There are a lot of really good foods out there that are bad for you. And there are a lot of really bad foods out there that are good for you. Isn't that true? It's just, for some reason, it usually works out that way. Sometimes you can find something that's really incredible that happens to also be really good for you. But they're rare. They're hard to find, okay? Most of the stuff that tastes amazing isn't that great for you. So the question is, Do you make decisions about how you feed your spirit based on what tastes good for you or what's actually nutritious and good for helping you grow, right? How do you decide? I remember a couple months ago, I told you about my wife's pineapple cough syrup, right? It's terrible, (laughs) really bad, but it happens to be good for me. And so you have to decide, am I going to decide how I'm 
taking in, the food that I'm taking in, is it going to be stuff that's good for me, like that helps me grow, or is it going to be stuff that tastes good, that I want to put in my body? And, and you got to think about it. Junk food usually tastes good, but it's not good for you. And what I want to do today, I don't want to, I don't want to spend time on number two talking about the obvious stuff. There's obvious spiritual junk food. There's filth and grossness all over this world that I shouldn't have to sit up here and say, hey guys, don't take that in. It's not good for you. I'll give you an example in kind of a practical sense. There's a, there's a restaurant in Las Vegas called Heart Attack Grill. <laughs> I think you know before you even walk into the place, is the food good for you there or bad for you there? Does the food in there probably taste amazing or bad? It's probably really tasty food, okay? I looked up one of the menu items at the Heart Attack Grill, and they have a burger there called the, tri or the Quadruple Bypass Burger. <laughs> Two pounds of beef, three slices of cheese, and 20 slices of bacon. I bet it's amazing, right? I mean, just hearing it, I'm like, I would love the challenge, right? It sounds, I, I bet it's delicious, but nobody wonders whether or not that meal is good for you, right? We all know that we're going to regret that tomorrow. We're going we're gonna to have weird dreams tonight, and I'm going to regret that a month from now. Like, it's not a good thing to eat. And so I don't want to spend time talking about the obvious junk food that we're not supposed to take into our bodies. What I want to do is, uh, is focus a little bit more on the tricky food. There's a lot of food out there that people tell you is healthy, but it's not. That's where we get tripped up a lot of times. You know, hey, this is good for you. And you're like, all right, I'm going to take as much of it as I want. And before you know it, you realize that wasn't really good for me. Let me show you in scripture what I'm talking about. First Timothy uh, chapter 4, the first couple verses, it says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. Or if we flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. In other words, what this verse is saying is there comes a time where people are going to, instead of choosing to eat things that are good for them spiritually, they're going to chase after the things that just taste good to them. And there's going to be people out there that deceive us, that are trying to, to convince us that certain foods for our spirit are good for us. And the truth is that they're not. They're incredibly unhealthy. And so we need to figure out the difference. One thing I love about this verse, if you see up there, it says, um, people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. That word sound, if you go back to the Greek, is the same word that we use for hygiene. Sound teaching would be like hygienic teaching, hygiene. And here's why I love that, that they use that, the word hygiene here. Have you noticed that when, you're, when you have, are practicing good hygiene, right? You got your deodorant on and you washed your hair recently and you take a bath regularly or shower and you soap up and you put on clean clothes and, and brush your teeth, right? You're just practicing good hygiene, have you noticed that when you're in that place of good hygiene, you can spot bad hygiene with your eyes and nose like 100 yards away? It's so obvious in that moment. You're like, whoo, that's not going to smell great. That doesn't look like someone has been in a shower recently, right? Bad hygiene is really easy to spot when you've been around good hygiene. And the same is true with 
with understanding good doctrine and understanding what's really true. It's people, if you are practicing and studying God's word and you understand it and you're taking in good spiritual food, when someone walks in and starts spewing off a bunch of nonsense that doesn't come from the truth of God's word, it's just like hygiene. You're going to be like, whoo, that does not smell right. That doesn't look right. That's not good. But the problem is, is that when you sit around bad hygiene for long enough, you stop noticing it. It doesn't, you get used to the smell and the stench. Even worse, some people, and it's okay to start somewhere, right? You're brand new to faith and you're still figuring out doctrine. You don't really know what this book teaches yet. You're trying to figure it out. So you're still kind of in a place of practicing bad hygiene. And you're probably not going to know when bad hygiene walks in next to you because you're not going to be able to smell it. You already smell your own stench. A great example of this, of people sometimes, they don't realize how bad they smell. If you've ever worked with middle school boys in student ministry before, <laughs> it is really, really bad. I mean, I, I remember one time I was... I was a cabin counselor for a group of middle school dudes, and we were at like a week-long camp. And we're talking like, there's recreation, they're out running around, doing things, uh, jumping into weird things, getting all just filthy. And I realized by the end of the week, I'm about to get into a 15-passenger van and drive home with these kids for three hours. I'm like, listen, none of you have taken a shower since we've been here. And before the end of the day, before you get in that van, you got to go get in the shower, because you guys stink, and you don't know it. And so this, this concept of hygiene, recognizing that, let me put it this way. Have you ever heard me say before that God has a plan for your life? Can you raise your hand if, you know, if you've heard that, believe that? God has a plan for your life. I want you to know, unfortunately, the opposite is also true. Satan has a plan for your life. The evil one wants to destroy you wants you to take in a bunch of spiritual junk food and to hang on to it and believe it. Because if you're a believer, he certainly wants to make you useless for the cause of the kingdom. He doesn't want anyone coming to know Jesus because of you. So he's going to fill your mind with a bunch of gr junk. And if you are not a follower of Jesus, if you do not know who Jesus is, he's certainly going to do whatever he can to fill your mind with whatever he needs to fill your mind with to destroy you so that you don't ever step into good sound, wholesome truth. And so we need to be very careful. 1 Peter 5.8 says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. See, there are many messages that Satan and his demons and this world would love for you to hear and consume. Even better for you to be convinced that they're true and to think you're eating something good. So we need to be very careful about the books that we read, the movies that we watch, the podcasters that we listen to, all these things. And if you're thinking, listen, my hygiene isn't great enough yet. My doctrinal understanding of God's word isn't solid enough yet to know if I should be reading this book. I encourage you to do a couple things. One, jump into our discipleship program. We'll teach you sound, wholesome doctrine. Number two, call the church. Hey, pastor, I'm reading this book. Have you ever heard of this author before? Is this, is this good or is this bad? And I'll, if I don't know, I'll do some research for you. But let other people help you. Let us help you. And by the way, I'll give you a good little tip. One book that you can always count on to be completely true is this one. In fact, if you don't have a copy of God's word, I want you to take the one from the chair back in front of you and write your name on it and keep it because that's one book you can always rely on for truth. It's a great resource. All right, number three, if you want to exer or have spiritual health, you need to, number three, exercise. You need to exercise. You need to take what's been, the good stuff you've been putting in and the bad stuff you've been avoiding and now you need to take whatever came of that and you need to use it. It says in James chapter 2, verse 14, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? What good is it if you eat a bunch of healthy food, you spend a whole bunch of time in God's word, but then you go out into the world and you don't put any of it to action? 
What good is any of that? What good is it to, to take in a bunch of stuff that's supposed to make your muscles stronger and then to not ever use your muscles? It doesn't make any sense. How about James chapter 1? Verse 22, it says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, by the way, this is the perfect law. If you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Simply put, we need to exercise our faith. We need to take what we're learning and we need to put it into action. We need to do it. In health, there's a phrase that we use often, uh, use it or lose it. If you have a muscle and you use it, you're going to strengthen it. It's going to stay strong. You'll be able to hopefully continue to use it. But if you stop using it, it's going to atrophy, right? You're not going to be able to use it anymore. We need to take our faith and we need to exercise it and do what the Bible says and practice it. Put our money where our mouth is. And one of the ways uh, that we encourage you to do that at this church is we have what we call our five catalysts. Five things that allow you to exercise your faith. The first one of those catalysts I want to talk about and, and how it relates to spiritual health is worshiping regularly. One of the five things that you need to do to exercise your faith is you need to be in an environment like this on a regular basis. Corporately connecting your, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, connecting it in koinonia with other believers and worshiping God corporately. This is an incredibly important part of exercising your faith. It's similar to if you were trying to, to, to bench press today more than you've ever bench pressed before, nobody would recommend you try to set a personal record on the bench press machine without a spotter standing behind you. You need to be around other believers who can spot you and help you as you try to move forward in this life. You weren't meant to worship alone. If you go back and look at that Colossians 3.16 verse, I want to encourage you with one part there. It says, remember it says, let this message about Christ and all of its richness fill your lives. And then it says, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. But then it ends, I added this underline. It says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. You know, one of the best ways that you can exercise your faith in corporate worship is simply to open up your mouth and sing songs of gratitude to God. In this church, we're often saying things like, hey, you know, if you want to sit down, you can sit down. If you want to stand up, you can stand up. If you want to put your hands up, do that. If you don't, like, hey, we want you to have, be comfortable in worshiping God how you need to do that as we sing these songs. But one thing that should be kind of a no-brainer for all of us is we can open up our mouths and, and let these songs of praise come out naturally. It's a great way to exercise your faith. God, I want to open my mouth and make sure these words of praise to you aren't just coming from the people around me. You know, the second catalyst we use around here is we, we uh, it's not, I'm not giving you these in order, but it's serve sacrificially. One of the ways that we exercise our faith is essentially we use the muscles that we've been feeding all this protein to, right? We're, we're feeding it good stuff. We're giving it some, some stuff that it needs to grow. But then we need to exercise those muscles by serving, by using the gifts, the spiritual gifts, the talents that God's given to you. Use those to serve God's purposes. The purpose of this church is the same purpose that God gave us in Matthew, the very end, right? Matthew 28. We know that we're called to go out into the world and make disciples, we want to be a church that sees people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. Get involved in that mission. Here, another third way that you can exercise your faith is, is through giving generously. Here's what I love about giving generously. Giving generously is similar in the, in the physical health sense of like stretching. You know, they tell you before you go to, to work out or lift weights or run a, a lap or whatever, right? You should stretch your body out first. You should stretch your muscles. 
Well, one thing about giving generously, when you have worked hard for something and you're like, this is my money, I worked hard for this, I know exactly what I want to spend it on, I know what I need, I know what I want. Giving generously to the cause of Christ is similar to like, God, I'm going to stretch my faith. I'm going to stretch it further than I did last time because I want to grow even more. So I'm going to stretch through giving generously. Another one of our catalysts is uh, connecting relationally in, in life groups. I love our life group ministry because it's similar to if you were to set a, a physical health goal, when you tell someone else about it, you have accountability. Have you ever noticed it's easier to show up at the gym at 4 a.m. when somebody else is supposed to meet you there at 4 a.m.? When you have a partner that you're holding each other accountable, it's easier to do the things that you're supposed to do. And that's what a life group is like. You join into a life group to exercise so that you have accountability. The last one would be growing personally. Our fifth catalyst is we need to do whatever we can to grow personally. The best example I can give you of this to connect it to health would be like when you're trying to set a PR. Anybody here know what PR stands for in the health world? Personal record, right? If you're going to set a personal record, what it simply means is you're going to lift more weight in that moment than you've ever done before. If you're going to set a personal record on the track, you're going to run the lap faster than you've ever done before. You're going to beat the last time you did it. You're going to get faster. You're going to set that personal record. Well, every time we walk in here on a Sunday, every time we open God's word at home, every time we gather together with our life group, we have an opportunity to say, tomorrow... I'm going to set a PR. I'm going to be more like Jesus tomorrow than I was today. That thing I keep struggling with, I'm going to struggle with it less tomorrow than I did today. Because I'm going to set a PR in growing personally. Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Y'all, I can't stress enough how much a gathering with other believers is crucial in helping you exercise your faith because we encourage one another and push and spur one another on to what God wants us to do. Here's the fourth one. Spiritual health, number four, you need to be careful. You need to be careful. And this is true in all areas of health. There's, there's moments where we can try to do too much all at once. We can push and try to lift more weight than our body can handle. We can try to run more than we should as we're, listen, if you're, if you're training to run a, a marathon, okay? If, if you're in this room and you've decided you want to run a marathon, Okay, you're crazy, first of all. Um, just kidding. I'm looking over here. Uh, anyway, um, if, if you decide you're going to run a marathon this year, you probably don't want to start by saying, tomorrow I'm going to go out and run 10 miles. I'm going to do half of it tomorrow just to warm up. No, that would be a really silly place to start because you're going to hurt yourself trying to do more than you can handle uh, the same would be true with lifting weights, right? You, you understand that some people, they, they don't take time to learn how to use a machine properly. They don't ask for the personal trainer to come and say, hey, I've never used this machine before. What am I supposed to do? Because they'll come and say, listen, yeah, it might feel like you can push a lot more weight on this one, but you really want to take it slow because it, the third rep is really going to hurt on this one. Or hey, now you want your posture to be back a little bit and you need your, you need your legs out a little bit further before you do this. Otherwise, you might hurt yourself. And there's a lot of people who have really great intentions of growing in health. And what they do is they step right in and they end up accidentally hurting themselves because they don't know what they're doing. And so when you give your life to Christ and you get really excited about this new relationship and this book that you have opportunity to read and understand, it's important not to get so excited that you go into it haphazardly. That you just let anybody speak into what it's saying. That you read past things you don't understand and just make it up for yourself. It's important that we're very careful to learn how to properly handle this book. And how to properly understand what we're reading. And, 
I'll give you a great example. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says a church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fail. You know what this is saying is if you take someone who's just super excited about their new faith in Jesus, and maybe they're so excited, they've spent time and they're reading through this book really quickly and they're just taking it as much as they can. That's awesome, by the way. I'm not knocking that kind of excitement. That's really, really great. But just make sure that you don't get to a pace or a place where you're thinking, I'm just so excited. God's done such incredible work that I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I know it all. I don't even need to. I could be teaching this right now. Put me on stage. I'm ready to teach. What God's word says, listen, we need to be careful to not do too much all at once to make sure we're properly growing into our understanding of God's word and how to handle it. And so we need to be careful. And so when you look at these four things, right? We talked about, we got to put good stuff in. We got to keep junk out. And remember, some of that junk doesn't look like junk. People tell you it's good for you, but it's not. Some of it, you got to be real careful. Number three, we got to exercise the things that we're learning about God. We got to put our faith to action. And, and number four, we need to be careful not to think we've got it all figured out. And not to, and to make sure we know where we're consuming things and that it's a good thing. For, we got to be careful. So for our what now God moment, we're going to put the words on the screen. And today, all I got for you for what now, I'm not going to put anything else up here. What I want you to do is two things. What is God right now prompting you to do to grow in your spiritual health? What is something from God's word this morning that the Holy Spirit has just prompted? You already know what it is. You probably don't have to take a moment and pray about it. You're like, you know what? I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm not. I need more of this. I need to be careful about this. I need to stop listening to that. I need to, whatever it is, would you, number one, would you write it down on the back of your note sheet this morning? Right where it says, what now, God? Write it down. That's the first thing. The second thing, I want you to find a spotting partner. <laughs> Someone to spot you. In other words, by the end of the day, show what you wrote down to someone else. Show it to your spouse. Show it to a friend. Send it to someone and say, hey, this is something God told me to work on in my spiritual health, and I need you to hold me accountable to this. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that when we open it, we know that we're reading truth. God, I pray that you would help us to, to be very intentional about setting a solid foundation of spiritual health that everything else can grow on top of. And we know that that solid foundation starts with pouring a concrete of, of good things into our soul. God, we need to pour your word into our bodies. We need to read this book, understand it, spend time asking you and others that are followers of you about it, God, that you would feed us good stuff. And would you give us a proper hygiene, a spiritual hygiene that allows us to know when there's a bad doctrine or a, something that someone's claiming is healthy for us, would we be able to have eyes to see what's not good for us so we don't eat spiritual junk food? And then God, would you help us to exercise the things that we're learning, to put our faith into action, and to be careful to do it in such a way that we don't fall into pride, but we recognize that you have a pace at which you're revealing things to us we, we thank you for the wisdom that your Holy Spirit is giving to each, each of us now. Would you give us the courage to write it down and to put it to, to action? We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.